to take this opportunity uh, on behalf of St. Elijah and the Alchem of the Christian Church, on behalf of the parishioners and the outreach committee, uh, to welcome you. And um, this is not the first time that we bring a speaker to our community. In fact, every year we bring two or three uh, well-known speakers to speak on the modern issues and historical issues, philosophical issues, theological, theological issues, and the pressing issues of our time. And uh, it takes a long time to get a person uh, uh, like Frank to come to Oklahoma City. He's on a, a circuit traveling, speaking all over the country, and uh, he made this arrangement with a long, long time. I do not know whether you have, you have heard of Frankie Schaefer before or not, but uh, Frankie is, uh, uh, Frank Schaefer is the son of Francis Schaefer, and uh, he is a well-known author and movie director. He is also dynamic and uh, much so after experts. Uh, he has written quite a few books, among them the Portofino, Dancing Alone, and the upcoming book is Letters to Father Aristotle, uh, just going to the publisher, and this is understood that uh, speaks about the real the problem of times, the, the, the problems we face in our time, as people uh, looking for the for the church and entering it. It's a uh, very very interesting uh, book, and of course, uh, uh, any one of you would like to, to purchase these books. There are forms in the back. You can fill the forms, and uh, any book that you wish to to, to purchase, just write them a check during the coffee hour or coffee break, and within a week or two you will um, receive this book. Of course, he's known as also has done lots of uh, directed movies, uh, quite a few articles he has written, and uh, Frankie uh, came to the Holy Orthodox Church uh, through a long years of study, and he will tell you uh, possibly that in his message, but he was uh, embraced in 1990 in uh, Boston. Uh, he is the son of famous evangelical Protestant theologian of the 20th century, that's Francis Schaeffer. Now, uh, Frank is known among the evangelical Protestant circles in this country. I'm thinking about Frank himself. And uh, whenever uh, he speaks, his voice is well heard. He is a really prophet of the century, and you would know why. At least we have an opportunity to listen to his voice. Um, because of his uh, journey to the Holy Orthodox Church, uh, many have found the church. As 60 to 70 percent of Christians today, who one time belong to a church, today do not attend a church. But uh, the voice of Frankie Schaefer and many others are lending an opportunity, a hand to people to know that there is a house that they can enter. There's no doors are being closed. Uh, Frank is married and has children. He's a very active man and uh, he is the uh, author uh, and edit I mean, editor of the Christian activists which you see there. These are complimentary for you. There is no uh, offering that we are not asking for you for any gifts. But these are for you to take with you and to give them also, pick up three, four, five. And the more you give these Christian activists, the better it is. Believe me, there are very uh, strong messages in these articles. And then if you would like to prescribe with a little donation, or even if no donation, they will send you one and it will be on their, on their list. Well, at this time, I, I uh, would like to uh, uh, welcome Frank Schaefer and I welcome you and he will be speaking to us on the subject where is the church of the New Testament? Can it be located in the 20th century? And I'm quoting uh, here a passage, uh, a message, a thought from him, quote, we live, we live in a nation that believes its 
to be intensely religious, however, religious fervor notwithstanding, faith in the historical teachings of the church is out of fashion in Amar. Very profound words. And here he is to give you his own personal message and testimony. Well,
visits. I made mistakes uh, when I was a kid about seven years old for an operation at the uh, uh, Pittsburgh Children's Hospital for a uh, muscle transplant, tendon, tra tendon transplant in, in my leg. I had polio. And I remember uh, going to uh, Pittsburgh. It happened to be um, the year that Pittsburgh was in the World Series and won that year, which I think was probably, what, 62? 1960. 60. Okay. <laughs> I knew you'd know it. 1960. Hang on to that memory. It's not happening again for a while, but never mind. And I remember being fascinated, but also somewhat embarrassed, because the people I was with, uh, who of course are being brought up in this American culture and who were part of the whole deal, uh, knew so much more about all this business that kids was, uh, were supposed to be involved with. And I, I felt very kind of the odd man out while enjoying it. And maybe that was one of the first times that I began to realize that sitting around a dining room table with a father who held dining room conversations for three or four hours at a time about modern philosophy and about religious issues and church history. And growing up in a family where people like uh, Dr. Billy Graham would drop by and other evangelical figures to talk with my dad and spend time in this retreat, people who had wandered away from their faith, students who were traveling in Europe and who had heard that there was a man there and a community there that would try to give honest answers to honest questions, that this was not your, your normal environment. And yet at the same time, it's something that I've grown to greatly appreciate because growing up in that community, I was certainly given a sense of two things that have stuck with me the rest of my life. One, I was taught to name the name of Christ in a serious manner, in a way that believed in the historical Christ, not just as an idea or the figment of our imagination, but as the person who was God and became man in the incarnation and died for us and was raised again through whom we find salvation. But the second idea of far less importance, but nevertheless very pivotal for me, was that ideas matter. And that as a man thinketh, so is he. And that the consequence of wrong ideas or getting wrong answers to questions or asking no questions at all was something that you paid a heavy price for. And a lot of the people who came through the Greek Fellowship had paid a heavy price. There were kids who had dabbled in the drug culture, I remember in the 1960s, and people who had become part of the existentialist movement. And I can remember people coming through who had been beat poets in the beat generation, and professors, for instance, like Timothy Leary from Harvard, who I remember visited a couple times, who had uh, followed his own advice and turned on and dropped out and had paid a heavy personal consequence, aside from his hippie ideology he was spreading. And I was able to see that different ideas lead to different results, that history and personal lives are not shaped by accident. They are shaped by choices, right choices and wrong choices. And above all, those choices are based on certain ideas, who people are, who we are, what answers we accept. Another thing that growing up in Magri taught me was a number of spiritual values that in hindsight as an Orthodox Christian I now look back to with great appreciation. For one thing, my parents were not very good Protestants. That may sound odd, but they did not follow the Protestant teaching on certain things very well. They were very inconsistent in their Protestant philosophy, but they were quite good at reinventing the Orthodox wheel in a way that I did not understand at the time, but I look back at now and I'm quite amazed that they found, by trial and error, some of the things that the church has taught from time immemorial as part and parcel of what it means to be a Christian. I'll give you one example. Once a week in the grade, everything would stop on Mondays, and we would have a day of prayer and fasting. And literally, no food would be served during the whole day. And one would sign up on the prayer chart for a fast. And what amazed me is that later, as I found out, that part of the Christian tradition was the monastic and ascetic tradition of spiritual struggle and fasting around the church calendar, in an odd way, it was no wonder that this was a familiar concept to me, because I had grown up in a Protestant community that had acted as if prayer really mattered, and that it wasn't just a matter of asking for things and a sort of a selfish wish list, but the idea of spiritual struggle, including even physical struggle, works, if you like, in this case being fasting, were something important. And so, in an odd way, the brain and my parents and the evangelical community uh, in a kind of a backhanded manner, uh, were a very good preparation for what I would discover later within the historical church itself, but now in the formal context that had never kind of forgotten these things, did not have to reinvent this wheel. And there would be no 
numerous other examples that I can talk about. But suffice to say that my own journey, spiritually and as a human being, began in this community. I was married there, had my first children there, and uh, then in uh, 1980 moved to this country where I've lived in Massachusetts ever since. Interestingly enough, having grown up in this very uh, spiritual and religious setting, my own work was encouraged by my parents uh, from a very early age, and again, I'm very grateful for the fact that they were not the kind of enculturated fundamentalist Protestants that you see so much in this culture. Why? Because when I started taking painting seriously, my dad took me to Florence and the Uffizi and Venice and the Byzantine icons of Ravenna and taught me about art. And when I took the film business seriously, my father as a teenager used to te take me to see Federico Fellini's pictures and Vittoria De Sica's pictures and Buñuel and all the serious European filmmakers that would be anathema to so many Protestants because of the content that they wouldn't like or whatever. Why? Because my dad took the art seriously, ideas seriously, culture seriously, and he was not of the opinion that everything had to be nice or family entertainment or everything had to agree with your position but that you could look at something and on the basis of what you believed and who you were, what you knew, you could use your mind and analyze it, and that we were not to be afraid of ideas or the wider culture. So in an odd way, the foundation for the work I've done as a novelist in the secular community, although it's one of the, the uh, books on this little sheet here is Portofino, which is a novel, work of fiction published by Macmillan a couple of years ago, actually about growing up in a Protestant family, one uses what one is given. Uh, it's not biographical, by the way, for those who want to know. Uh, you read it, no, uh, this is not my family, but it's a family somewhat like mine. So I learned from that experience. But whether it's that, or some of the secular filmmaking I've made, or some of the filmmaking in the religious community, uh, again, my parents taught me very much that ideas are important, and not to something to be askewed, or to be afraid of, or avoided, but that, as my father said, and he really had a fitting epitaph on his gravestone, this is what it would be. Um, he has a Bible verse on it, which is also fitting, but uh, in terms of a personal epitaph, he said, honest questions deserve honest answers, period. Let the chips fall where they may, was his viewpoint. And I can often remember him in discussion simply saying, I don't know, uh, in answer to a question, or I'll have to study this more or uh, give me some time to think about it and ask that question again. In fact, his idea that honest answers and that uh, the free use of our intellect, thank you very much, a glass of water for being here, um, that the free use of our intellect is something to be treasured and not to be afraid of, often put him, that's fine, often put him into a certain amount of conflict with other Protestants, particularly those who came from his background, which for those of you who are do not know what this is, uh, is called Reformed Theology or the Calvinist part of Christianity, from which he moved far, far away by the end of his life, to the point where he would get very much disappointed in his Calvinist friends from places like Westminster Theological Seminary from years before, because he no longer towed the party line. My dad became a very poor Calvinist indeed, because he was someone, again, who took ideas seriously. He didn't take theology that seriously by the end of his life to him. The theological, the artistic, the cultural, uh, the historical merged into something called truth and history. And he didn't divide these things into these little neat, watertight, almost paranoid compartments that you find so much in theological discussion between various denominations and so forth today. My dad was a very open person that way. Why do I give you this background? Well, because I think that when you're looking at someone or listening to someone, who has moved in a spiritual journey from a Protestant experience of Christianity to an orthodox and historical one, in this case, some biographical details, some personal insight is warranted. Uh, because obviously, I would not have the gall to stand here and tell you that I suddenly discovered the historic church, and there were no personal reasons involved. It had nothing to do with my background. And it was simply on the basis of truth itself. I wish I could be that objective. I'm certainly not, and I would imagine you are not either. So with that background, let me say that in a, in a kind of a more formal way, I guess I would trace my journey to the historical church and what it's been for 2,000 years with the growing dissatisfaction in my own life that came out of a number of personal as well as, I guess you could call it, intellectual or theological experiences or concerns. On the personal side, I must say that as the years went on and as an adult, particularly as a parent of 
with young children who were then growing older, as someone who had been married for a number of years at that point, let's say this was, say, 15 years ago, uh, something like that, um, I began to have a sense of a tremendous vacuum in one area of my life. And that was the area of accountability. I didn't see any Christians being accountable to anyone beyond themselves or what they said the Bible said, which is not the same thing as what the Bible says, of course. What you say it says is your interpretation. I saw a great lack of accountability. And in the area of personal life, I must say that the idea of accountability to me was borne home by the fact that often confession, if you want to put it that way, was really a lonely, muttered prayer into my own pillow. And had I not behaved in a certain way or changed my mind, and after my confession, as it were, into my pillow, I've gone back and, uh, and done exactly the same thing again, there was no one around who would come and say, Frank, what on earth are you doing? You came here last week and said you were having a problem in this area, and now you're back again saying the same thing. You know, if you don't shape up, uh, and if you don't change, there'll be the certain following ramifications. And I realized that the very discipline I expected of my own children, uh, who were growing up in my family, and some idea of accountability, not perfection, but accountability, was something that in no way uh, I was accountable for myself, very much like our United States Congress, uh, which until very recently did not obey its own regulations and its own laws that it burdened all the rest of us with, until enough people blew the whistle and said, look, if we're going to have affirmative action and we're going to have this kind of safety in the workplace and equal opportunity hiring practices in the rest of the country, you're going to have to be accountable to these rules too. So I guess my experience as a parent in trying to become the bottom line for my own children very much showed me in a kind of a graphic way, perhaps unconsciously at first, that I had no bottom line. I was simply out there twisting in the wind. To me, accountability was something that really did not exist. It was more a matter of hoping you could get away with things and no one would know about them, or that you could slowly pull yourself up by your bootstraps, or a little pastoral counseling, or a little fervent Bible study, but really all over the map. There was no sense of answering to either a tradition, one set of beliefs, let alone any other human beings who either loved or cared for you enough that they really would hold you to a certain line. Moreover, if you did try to answer to someone within the Protestant background, you could then turn around and simply shift gears if you didn't like what they told you. I always was amazed how God personally always led me to do exactly what I was going to do anyway. It seemed to be a wonderful pattern. God was very much in tune with my wishes. So that if I was at a church and I didn't like the teaching because it challenged me or it confronted me in some way, then miraculously, uh, God led me to another church or to another denomination, and you could always move on. And if that failed, of course, within Protestantism, you would be free to start your own and just begin over again and have the church of Frank Schaefer or Frank Schaefer and his friends or the two friends he has left or the ones he didn't split with left or whatever it might be. And so I had this weird feeling, very much like Groucho Marx describes in that wonderful comedy statement of his that says that if he ever found a club that would like have someone like me to be a member, I'd never want to join. And uh, in an odd way, especially as my father became well known after I made a number of film series with him, and then in consequence, I became quite well known in evangelical circles because of books I had written and so forth. Speaking I did, you know, many appearances on the 700 Club with Dr. Dobson and all this sort of thing as the years went on. I suddenly realized very much what people say about Los Angeles. There's no there there. Uh, if I'm an evangelical figure, um, then we're in real trouble because there, there's nothing more than other people like me wandering around in semi-sincerity. I didn't say complete insincerity, semi-sincerity. Uh, basically grandstanding in one form or another and building personal followings, which they call ministries, often in great sincerity. But when they die, or they move on, or the people they founded this ministry with split from them, it goes up in smoke. Uh, just like all the great evangelistic ministries that are now totally unknown, because the founding evangelist died or moved on, or whatever it might be. And so, in looking at that situation, and looking at the situation of feeling that there was a real lack of accountability, my own sense was, 
in this evangelical kind of um, misty uh, soup, as it were, where you never touch bottom, where there's never any kind of final reality beyond the subjective opinion of what you think the God is telling you to do through the Bible or a sermon you heard or some other kind of subjective impression. And where all the theological standards are always in flux because Protestants have agreed to disagree. They've agreed that it's okay to have 23,000 denominations with different interpretations of the Bible. By the way, that number is a literal one. There literally are 23,000 Protestant denominations. Five new ones added a week, uh, according to the 1989 UN statistics, which are the last ones we have for that. And that uh, in, this, in this, the idea that you could find a tradition to which you are accountable uh, in which not only doctrine, but moral teaching and liturgical practice and worship practice is clearly defined, really uh, was kind of a hopeless case. So that was one side. And the other side was simply the actual state of the union, if you want to put it that way. You know, this was all very much during that triumphalist period where you had the burgeoning of things like the PTL Club and the 700 Club and Dr. Dobson and, and uh, of course, Billy Graham still doing what he did and not in any way commenting on all these as either being good or bad. Uh, forgive me if it sounds negative, I don't mean to be about that. A lot of good came from a number of these things. I'll let you decide which ones were which. But uh, nevertheless, there was a great era of triumphalism, and sometimes you would think that if you added all the people up who had supposedly had, quote, a personal decision for Christ end-to-end, -end, you like these wonderful things in children's textbooks, or if you lined up everybody who, uh, from this point to that point, who had ever done such and such, they reached the moon back, and so forth and so on. I remember thinking, well, the whole country's been saved a hundred times over, if you believe these numbers. And, and, and reading things in the Gallup poll, you know, 93% of the American public say they believe in God, and 68% say they've had a born-again experience. Well, isn't it wonderful? You know, bit back, boom, forward, and, you know, we got our 10,000 donors, and they're sending $1,000 in each, and send 25 bucks, and we'll take care of the secular humanists, and so forth and so on. But at a certain point, if I step back from all this sound and fury signifying nothing, or at least very little, and look at the actual state of the union, the one that our presidents like Clinton and Bush and Reagan lie about every time they speak by telling us that we're a good and generous people and that this is a wonderful country, the one where the rubber really hits the road, a very different story emerged. A nation that was aborting one third of its unborn babies every year. A nation where in half the marriages were ending in divorce. A nation that had made its children the wards of a failed educational system that most pagan societies would have rejected as unfit. A country that made its children the wards of the divorce courts and the daycare centers when it didn't actually kill them. A nation more adept to teaching 10 year olds how to use condoms than how to read. In other words, not even on a moral level. A horribly sentimental nation that gathers around the, the, uh, the, a little well hole somewhere when a little girl falls down that well hole, an 18 month old baby, and holds their breath, and uh, weeping fire and bring the children out in the same 30 hours she's down there. 4,000 babies are aborted who are exactly the same kinds of human beings, they're just a few months younger. A terribly sentimental country that's mistaken sentimentality for virtue, whose answer to Auschwitz, if you like, is Disneyland. They cannot coexist side by side. This country, this country of failed marriages, a functioning illiterate population, um, a country of aborted babies, a country of every social pathology known to man, one that goes off and fights the desert storm conflict in the Middle East, and in that, 132 people uh, from the American side killed on the ground in the, in the same 102 hours or whatever it was. There's 10 times that amount of people gunned down on our city streets. It's far more dangerous to be just a young person in our inner city than our military service. That supremely decadent nation did not seem to have much to do with all the talk and smoke and fury and forward momentum of the people who were acting as if we were in the middle of some new religious revival. Because any history that I ever read in terms of religious revival, any other history that I've read in terms of period of history, did not show perfect people in the middle of a religiously observant age, but it certainly did not show cultures that were spiraling out of control. Just to give you one example, if you look at St. Basil the Great in the early ages of church history, you will find that he stood against infanticide, child sacrifice, and abortion. And along with the other church fathers, right back from the beginning, starting with the Didache, which was, uh, which was
which goes back to about the year 80 to 120, depending on how you date these things, um, and the teaching of the apostles that comes through that. Here you had the church consistently standing on the issue of human life, and they brought real change. The incivility of the collapsing Roman Empire was not placed by, replaced by perfection, but the growing number of Christians actually had an effect on the culture wherein child sacrifice was finally outlawed, wherein female children were not just left on the garbage dump for the wolves and the crows and the ravens to get, wherein abortion was outlawed, wherein the sacrament of marriage that the church held up as a sacrament along with the sacrament of the Eucharist and baptism, confession and penance and the other sacraments of the church <clears throat> was given a, a special and divine place in the human community wherein women could not just be dumped out into the cold if their men tired of them, but we began to have this Christian idea of marriage and community and family and so forth, replacing the pagan, uh, uh, the pagan idea of female servitude. Look where you like, you did not see a perfect culture. You saw a culture full of sinful human beings, but there was a historical correlation to the, you might say, uh, propaganda. There was a lot of talk about Christianity, and we began to see some results. And it's not only back in the emerging church out of the pagan era. There would be other examples even nearer in our own time, even in the Protestant era. And so I began to have this kind of personal questioning of a lack of accountability, a lack of tradition, and, another, and, a, and a cultural questioning of this so-called Christian nation, where if you listen to the propaganda from many Christians, you would think that somehow America had always been a Christian nation founded by some wonderful Puritans and then something had gone desperately wrong and the ACLU and the National Organization of Women had formed to steal this great country from these God-fearing folks who, who no fault of their own, uh, had kind of been supplanted by these secularists and agnostics and atheists and so forth. And I began to really wonder if this simplistic version of American history was not somewhat uh, simplistic was not untrue, uh, basically. And so I started thinking, maybe there's some things for me to really think about here, and, and uh, that, along with the sense that evangelicalism, which I was part of, the Protestant movement, which I was joined at the hip with, uh, as an author, as a speaker, and so forth, and so on, and so on, um, and through my family, if there wasn't something fatally flawed about this whole mixture, if some of the, if some of the pluralism that we evangelicals so hated in the secular culture, this relativism, this situational ethics, wasn't somehow rooted back into the very Protestant experiment itself that it introduced the idea of a pluralistic way to approach God, where you could belong to any denomination, believe virtually anything you want, subscribe to any tradition, worship in any way you want, and yet somehow this was all called Christianity in the same way that you have this huge tent called America that includes everything from neo-fascist feminists who want to kill babies all the way through to uh, the most orthodox and conservative uh, orthodox priest and all points in between. Somehow this tent, called, this whole thing is called America. Well, this very pluralistic idea, this idea of many ways to the truth, well, that's just your personal opinion that I think differently and don't impose your values on me. This whole thing that so many Protestants even object to, I began to wonder if the formulation of that idea hadn't come through some alien force, some group of secularists or humanists, but was part and parcel of the Protestant experiment, wherein you decide that you throw out all tradition, all church history, you cut yourself off from the history of the church, and then you start just with the Bible. But unfortunately, the Bible has to be interpreted, and so you start with thousands of subjective interpretations of the Bible, which come to be called sola scriptura, although, of course, it's never the scripture, it's the interpretation of the scripture, because words on the page don't read themselves. Eyes have to read them and interpret them, and suddenly you wind up with these 23,000 competing denominations from Episcopalians over here ordaining women and homosexuals through to the most conservative a Baptist church on this side, through to this, through to this, through to that. And uh, at a certain point, this is the breeding ground for the modern American idea that there is no such thing as truth, and that the only ultimate value is that there are no moral absolutes, and that the only thing that won't be tolerated is intolerance of any idea except the idea that everything is equal and everything goes, this kind of modern politically correct mantra that's taught in our universities. So I began to wonder. Well, as a result, 
I decided that it was time for me to do something that uh, I had not ever done. And I began to read a little bit of church history. Now, growing up in, a, in what you might call a fairly kind of uh, well-read intellectual Christian environment, um, my first big surprise was when I began to read church history is that I knew nothing about what I was reading about. And perhaps that's an arrogant statement, but I always have thought that I had a pretty good smattering of general knowledge on a number of topics. Um, and to come into a field that was so close to supposedly what I believed as a Christian and to find I really knew nothing was quite surprising to me. I discovered that my idea of church history actually began with the Reformation, which of course is 1,500 years into church history. And even that I really didn't know much about. What I sort of knew about was the denominational path of Calvinism and a little bit about Anglicanism coming into the Episcopal Church because for 10 years I had been worshiping in an Episcopal Church when I moved to this country. But I really knew nothing about church history, the history of the church to which everyone who calls himself a Christian finally owes their salvation in a very direct way. Why? Because someone for 1,500 years kept passing that torch so that there could be Christians in the world today, whatever they might be called. The Bible was not buried in a jar somewhere and rediscovered by Martin Luther. It was copied and passed down and taught and corrected and defended by countless generations of monastics, ascetics, and bishops. The books of the Bible were not suddenly lowered on a golden tablet like the Book of Mormon. The books of the Bible were coalesced into something called the canon of Scripture, both the Old and the New Testament, by, and this was a big surprise to me as, a, 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 as someone who had never really studied this before, and always pictured that sort of the Bible had arrived in its original King James translation in about a year. Ten, you know, the old joke about the, the Protestant minister who says, well, if the King James Bible was good enough for the disciples of Christ, it's good enough for me. <laughs> And I wouldn't have gotten what was funny about that joke, because I would have said, well, what's wrong with that? Uh, maybe not that bad, but somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. But it was a great surprise to me. And the, the key here was is that as I began to read some church history, I didn't read Protestant church history. I read church history. It's two different things. I read Eusebius' history of the church from the 4th century. And I read Ugyra's diary of the pilgrimage to the Holy Land from the 3rd century. And I began to reread the book of Acts in the light of the patristic fathers, the Antinicene fathers, people like Irenaeus of Lyon, people like Polycarp, people like Ignatius of Antioch from the year 110, the great founder of the church. Um, and I began to understand that there wasn't some clear divide between the last book of, of, uh, 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 about New Testament history in the Acts or the Epistles and someone like Polycarp who was writing a commentary on these books who himself had known John the Evangelist, for instance. And I realized that, that, uh, that uh, this Protestant myth of this idea of somehow the New Testament standing alone and, and aside from the church, if you, ask, if you would ask me at that era, what do you base your faith on? I would have honestly looked at you without uh, knowing how ironic this was, and I would have said to you, well, I don't base it on any man-made tradition, let alone the historic church. I base it on the Bible. And I really wouldn't have understood what a ridiculous statement that is, because I was as ignorant as many Protestants are of the history of their own Bible, which is, of course, a history that took 300 years or more to be formulated. The Bible was not lowered on a golden tablet. First of all, it was written. Then, the Bible, in its New Testament form, not speaking of the Old Testament, was in competition with hundreds of other religious writings. Epistles, Gospels, Gnostic Gospels, heretical writings, good writings, mediocre writings, and so forth. What became the New Testament were those books that survived the scrutiny of the church fathers of the first 300 years. Or as Irenaeus of Lyon says to the heretic who writes to him in that famous exchange on the scripture, how do you know, what do you count as, as, the, the, as the real books of the New Testament? He says, well, obviously, those that have been counted as authentic since the beginning by the most ancient seas in the church. Well, that's no different than you saying to me, well, I've got all these books that purport to be by your father, Francis Schaeffer. How do we know which were real and how were the forgeries? And I look through them and I say, well, that one's real because we still got the manuscript in the attic. This one's a fake. I never heard of it, never saw it. Uh, I was with my dad uh, his whole life. We don't have a manuscript. There's no record of it. It's in his style. It sounds sort of like him. But look, here's four things that definitely he never would have said, beyond which, look, I've got a suitcase with his original manuscripts in it. These are the epistles of Francis Schaeffer, because I happen to know the eight people he wrote them to, and we've got the original ones 
here. It's no more dramatic than that. It's an historical statement, not, um, not a philosophical, let alone a theological statement. It wasn't one of faith. In other words, you could say, well, the whole thing is bankrupt. Christ never rose from the dead. It's a myth. But no historian uh, has ever questioned the fact that the reason we have the New Testament is because the fathers of the church, the second and third generations of Christians, decided what books should be in and out. What's interesting today, for instance, is that feminist theologians uh, are going back and resurrecting the Gnostic Gospels now because uh, the, the heresies that are contained in them are very friendly to many modern New Age type ideas. That's why they were heresies then. That's why they're heresies now. The odd thing is, though, a lot of Protestants, a lot of perhaps uninformed Orthodox or other people would say, well, uh, the Gnostic Gospels can't be real because they're not the original. They're not as ancient as Scripture. And the curious thing is there are Gnostic Gospels which are just as old as the books we have in the New Testament. Heresy has existed in the church from the beginning. Uh, false teaching has existed from the beginning. As anybody who's read the New Testament will know without reading any history. And just because something is venerable and ancient doesn't make it right. Well, how do you know the difference between the venerable and ancient faith, the wonderful venerable forgery, and the venerable and ancient genuine article. Well, you know because you have to trust the witness of a certain body called the church. Without that, without the church, as a matter of history, not theology, whatever one's belief theologically, on a historical basis, no church, no Bible. If you don't trust Irenaeus and Ignatius, you cannot trust Luke and Acts and Philippians either. Because these are the people who said these books belong in the canon. These are the people who defended them. Uh, a very late defense, a very late edition, being, for instance, um, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was added almost 400 years after the New Testament era. It hadn't been defended. It hadn't been understood at that point. There were a number of saints, Athanasius being foremost among them, who absolutely defended its veracity. It was a very controversial book. And had Athanasius not defended it, as canonical, it wouldn't have been in the scripture. And it almost wasn't. And there are many branches of early Christianity that have never included it. And yet it's in what is our definitive and canonical scripture. Why? Because there were certain saints of the church who defended it and defended its importance from the beginning. And what's interesting is a Protestant coming to this history, what you sort of took as a received wisdom, as if it had just dropped from heaven magically, you realize has a human history. But if you think about it for a minute, that's not at all outside of the frame of reference that all Christians, Protestants, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, and others understand. Why? Because we don't believe that our Savior came to us magically from another planet. He did not arrive in a flying saucer or a spaceship. He arrived in the womb of a human girl. He arrived in an amniotic sac. He arrived, he arrived taking his nutrition he arrived and planted in the uterine wall of a female. He was, when he was born, there was real blood on the straw and the blanket. He suckled at a human breast. He walked streets that he got footprints on. When he did his miracles, he did not call down new colors or divine apparitions. He broke bread. When he gave us our great sacrament of the Eucharist, he didn't invent some new substance, something he had never seen before. Uh, he did not do conjuring style magic tricks. He worked with the stuff of creation. He became a real man as well as maintaining his divinity as a real as the real God. But he gave us wine and bread, and he he reanointed, if you like, the old Jewish rite of baptism, that of course was practiced long before the Christian era by prophets, John the Baptist being the latest, and made that a Christian sacrament. He worked with the stuff of the human condition. This is one reason I'm a Christian and not a member of some other religion. Because Christianity is one of the only religions that stays within the boundaries of the time and space reference created by God. We don't believe in fairy stories in a strange way. We believe in the supernatural, but we believe in a reasonable God who intervenes in human history in the manner in which he has created, not fighting against his creation, but within it. When Christ raised people from the dead, like Lazarus, they stayed within the human time continuum. They were not simply transported to another time and another place. And so to me, if you might put it this way, the space-time dimension and the historicity of the development of scripture within the framework of the church 
was something that for me added to my sense of faith within the Christian framework because at last year was something that actually made some sense. It was not this idea of blind trust for some inexplicable reason in a book because some verse in the book says that it is inspired by God. But here you see the people of God for 20 centuries defending these books and these books alone and the teaching therein as the basis of the faith which brings redemption and salvation to the human race. Another thing I found in reading some church history was that my idea of worship was very different from the idea of worship in most of the historical church until very recently in our own era, more than 1,500 years. If you read my book, Dancing Alone, which as I explained to order uh, uh, earlier, you can order, you will find that there's a fairly detailed explanation about how worship and the sacramental uh, tradition developed in this area. But just giving a thumbnail sketch, it occurred to me one day that if someone had come from almost any period of history to our own kind of pre-formed Protestant era, any period of Christian history, that is, let's say a peasant from 3rd century Carthage, or somebody from 2nd century Antioch, or whatever it might be, any period, a thousand years after the beginning of Christendom, from the high Byzantine era, wherever you might touch it, and you brought them in a time capsule into the modern Protestant American era, and you dumped them in any local Protestant church on a Sunday morning, and you said to them, where are you? I'm not talking about the bewilderment of time travel and neon lights. I mean, assuming all that, and assuming they understood English. Literally, and again, this is not a theological statement about who's saved or lost. I'm not talking about any of that. We're just talking about the historical church here. Literally, I don't think there's anyone who would look at this who would disagree. They would not be able to tell you where they were in exactly the same way that if you took me and you blindfolded me and you drove me out of Oklahoma City here, 20 minutes and drop me in a field and you said, take off the mindful, where are you? I'd say, I have no idea where I am. But if you took me and you blindfolded me and you flew me back to Switzerland on the patch of ground I grew up as, as, as a kid, and you took off that blindfold, I could mark you about a 50 square mile radius. Uh, and anywhere in that radius, I would only have to briefly, in, momentarily see the shape of the skyline familiar rock, the way three trees grow on the, the outcropping of rock up there where I used to ski at Ozondag, any of those things. And I'd say instantly, I am in Switzerland, I am on the north face of the Argentine, I've hiked here, I've camped here, I've sat here having picnics, I've skied here, I know what this looks in any life, in any weather, at any time of day. I grew up here, this is my home territory. Now I'm talking about that kind of familiarity and instant recognition. Now the reason for this is because obviously what has happened in the Protestant era, for many, many reasons that I go into in detail in my books, especially Dancing Alone and Letters to Father Aristotle, is that there has been an evolution since the time of the Reformation away from even the certainties of Reformational Christianity. Uh, Calvin and Luther and Zwingli and those people would barely recognize themselves what was going on if they walked into the modern Protestant context. But if you took someone from the historical church, the pre-reformational church, and especially the pre-schism church, that means before the East and the West divided and the Roman Catholics went off in their own direction, you took someone from the historical church, where it was the church and then there were heretics, but those heretics were not in competition or forming, quote, new denominations. They were clearly outside the church. And you brought them in their own ear. They would literally not know where they were. Now, they might not necessarily disapprove of everything so they might say, it's a great Bible study, it's a lecture, it's a concert, it's a sermon, it's a rock concert, it's a festival of some sort, uh, it's a circus, it's a whatever. But they would not say, this is a Christian worship service. Why? Well, you only have to scratch the surface of the historic church to realize certain things have remained very constant from the beginning. Very constant. For one thing, Christian worship has always, and this may come as a surprise to some Protestants who, who, like me, would not have known what this meant, has always been highly sophisticated and liturgical. There was never a simple, quote, New Testament church. How do we know that? Well, for one thing, we know it from Scripture. When we read about Christ going to worship, uh, Christ himself, I'm speaking in the human part now, not as God, of course, who knows all, but in the 
the human sense, Christ, of course, would have had no idea what evangelical worship was. We're told when he went to worship, he went to the synagogue. We're told when he went to the synagogue, he opened and read the passage for the dead. He stayed within the Hebrew liturgy. The idea of extemporaneous worship, even for the Son of God, that you just say, well, God led me to read this passage and here's what I think, uh, would have been as unfarmed to Christ as it would have been to anybody in the historical church. When Peter's shadow fell on the paralytic, where was he going in the book of Acts? He was going to keep the ninth hour of prayers in the synagogue. What were the ninth hour? Well, the schedule of prayer and fasting and worship and liturgical and ascetic struggle in the Old Testament era was very, very close to what was maintained in the Christian era. And the early Christians, as we read in the book of Acts, as we read in New Diary's Diary of the Pilgrimage, as we read in uh, as we read in Eusebius' festival oration at the Church of Tyre, any place you look in church history, from the book of Acts onward, you will find a very direct correlation. Well, for instance, the Psalms were not read as literature, nor were the Psalms studied by theologians. What, were they, what did people do with the Psalms from the beginning? They prayed them. They always have been prayers. They always were prayers. In the church, they always will be prayers. They were never the subject for study. This wasn't a cold science. This was the essence of worship. That doesn't mean you've never thought about them. But the Psalms were prayers. How were the Gospels read in the church from the beginning? They were read out loud within the liturgical context. How were the Epistles read from the beginning? In the churches first to whom they were written, and then other churches to whom they were circulated, as these most ancient churches swore to their veracity, if you like. They were always read liturgically as part of the service. They were not read in some isolated scholarly vacuum. They were not read in a literary vacuum. It was not some feminist women's studies program. It was not some higher critical method of textual analysis. It was none of these things. They were read liturgically. They were read publicly. They were read out loud. Only one copy would exist per congregation. If we don't believe this, then we have to understand that the first 300 years of Christian history, including the apostles themselves, were not Christians because they did not have a New Testament, so there could be no sola scriptura. Their faith was not based on the Bible. The Bible to them was the Old Testament Septuagint from which Christ quoted, and loose scattered various uh, passages, some that were known, some were less known, some being developed, some not yet written, uh, that, we, that finally coalesced into the New Testament. A canon that was not closed for some 300 years. We have to understand that if the worship of the Old Testament and the New Testament church, this liturgical form of worship, this historic and orderly manner of worship, that this became normative for the first 1,500 years of the church and some, if you come up into an Orthodox church today, for instance, you have to understand that it leaves us with only one or two conclusions in looking at some of this Protestant chaos when it comes just to this area of worship. One, the Protestant era has discovered some new wonderful truth and enlightenment unknown to the apostles and everyone else in church history, and that we should be thankful for the 23,000 denominations, the divisions between us, the chaos, the conflicting uh, doctrines and moral teachings, that this is exactly what Christ intended for his church, and Athanasius, and Irenaeus, and Polycarp, and John, and Peter, and Paul were wrong. And so that when Peter was going up to the ninth hour to keep his monastic ritual of prayer, which is exactly what it was, and, uh, and when Christ read the passage for the day, instead of saying, well, God just laid this on my heart, and we just this, and we just that, and extemporaneously praying, that they were wrong. There's not any two ways about it. Because we have moved so far away that in essence we have created a new religious experience. It is not liturgical. It is certainly not sacramentally focused. It is something new. It has many overlaps. It uses many of the same words. Many of the people within the Protestant community are diligently seeking Christ. Many are far more Christian and closer to Christ than many people who are Orthodox or have been in the liturgical church. No question. God sees the heart. But, having said that, on the basis of history, on the basis of reality, on the basis of what preserved this New Testament that we all look at so hard, it is no question that it's totally a different climate of one of liturgical order. And so when I was beginning to read some of these things, when I was beginning to do some of this study, as I was beginning to come through my own journey in this area, there came a day when I really had to ask myself a question, and that was, did I understand what it meant to 
be a Christian. Now, be careful here. Nobody actually walk out until I finish this, uh, because you'll leave with a misapprehension. No one's walking out, by the way, but uh, <laughs> at least bear me out in this. I did not say what it meant to become a Christian. How one is saved is a holy mystery, and let me just give you one example of it. The thief on the cross, we are pretty well assured of his salvation, aren't we? No one assures us, no one assures us of many of the apostles' salvation. The church tells us they're saints and they're saved, but Christ himself said that the thief on the cross would be with him in paradise that day, didn't he? Something he didn't say about many people. We don't hear that about almost anyone else in the scripture, by the way. It's interesting. But we're told the thief on the cross will be in paradise. Now, there's an interesting paradox there. One of the few people in the whole New Testament era to whom salvation, to whom salvation, what it meant to become a Christian, as distinct from what I'm going to be talking about in a minute, which is what it meant to be a Christian, one of the few people that the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, you will be in paradise with me today, neither had theology, sacrament, or a salvation experience. This person fits neither the Protestant or Orthodox bill in a dogmatic sense. Not baptized, not chrismated in a theological sense, certainly had no born-again experience. And yet, God sees the heart and understood that those things that are required to come to salvation were mystically fulfilled. Why? Because from an Orthodox point of view at least, we leave God as God, the Holy Mysteries as the Holy Mysteries, <coughs> And the salvation of each individual as something that in the end is only known to God himself. All right? So let me just say that in terms of the mystery of salvation, who is in or out of the church, or who came in this way or that way, or who has been in the historical church or out, is not what I'm talking about. Because becoming a Christian, and who will be saved in the end, as the Orthodox Church says, I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved, this is a journey in this is a journey that you have to complete. Yes? I hope we may this is a good point to take a break. Right. I'll have a cup of coffee and come back and address that. We'll wrap up in just in, in uh, five more minutes and then we'll have our break and we'll coffee. Right. I'm going to sell some books too, so I'm a big fan. Because there's lots of questions, I'm sure. Yeah. So to me, what you have to look at is in, in this area of salvation, you cannot have a misapprehension coming from a Protestant background that when you hear someone talking about what the historical church is or when you hear someone talking about this flow of history uh, that it is to be confused with personal salvation. That said, uh, in reading some church history and looking at these matters, or if you read, for instance, in my book, Dancing Alone, or uh, some of these other works, or read the Christian activist back there, you will find that the historical view of the church and Christianity is very different in the Protestant in three ways. And that is that the Protestant view tends to focus in primarily on this idea of some personal encounter with Christ, and then that's about it, however you slice it. The historical church teaches something very different. The historical church teaches that an encounter with Christ has nothing to do with what it means to be a Christian. Remember, I'm not talking about salvation. But that to be a Christian is something visible. It's not just internalized, and it's visible in three ways. First of all, if you want to picture three legs of a stool, to be a Christian means that you sit on this stool and your weight is borne and you like by three legs, or like three columns of an evidence. One is something called doctrine, and that's not some highfalutin technical term. It means those things believed by all Christians in all times since the beginning. And that is in the existence of God, virgin birth, the resurrection, these things that are the linchpins of our faith. And no matter how sincere you were, or no matter how diligent in your study, or how nice a guy, or how many Bible studies you led, or whatever else, at a certain point, if you said, I am being a Christian, this is what it means to be a Christian, and I just happen not to believe in the divinity of Christ. Some bishop, or monk, or nun, or other church of fire authority would finally wander up to you and say, that's great, I'm glad for you, but you are a heretic. This is not what it means to be a Christian. Because if you don't believe in the divinity of Christ, you may be a nice person, you may be sincere, but you are sincerely not a being a Christian. And even then, perhaps not judge the person as damned or lost. 
certainly if, if it would be a, a something one would caution someone, you better consider this idea because you're flying in the face of the witness of the church. But it's certainly what it means to be a Christian means these beliefs and these doctrines. The second area was one of moral behavior. You could believe all the doctrines you wanted. You could receive the creed until you were blue in the face or the Westminster Confession or anything else you chose to receive. But you would come to a time when someone would say, yeah, you're, you, you have all this doctrinal purity, but you're running an abortion clinic, you just left and abandoned your wife and children. This is not what it means to be a Christian. You cannot be killing innocent babies and abandoning your wife or whatever it might be. You can repent of that. You can say you're sorry and come back into the church and be in good standing. But if you persist unrepentant in this area, it does not, this means you are not being a Christian. I do not judge your eternal soul. I am not God. But I can tell you this is not what it means to be a Christian. If you sincerely want to be a Christian, the church has taught from the beginning, the doctrine is not alone what it means to be a Christian. Who you are, what you are becoming, how you are following Christ, this is what it also means to be a Christian. There is a third area, and this is the one that surprised me most, and with which I'll conclude just before our break here, and that I knew the least about. If you read the lives of many people in church history, and you read church history, actually this last item would be put first in terms of how people practice their faith. To be a Christian meant you worshiped in a certain way. It was no different than what it meant to be a Jew. If someone said, well, I am a Jew, and I keep this law, and I do this, and I do this, but, you know, I've never been in a synagogue, and my idea of worship is to sacrifice to Molech or Wotan, um, and I keep no liturgical traditions whatsoever, and the Psalms are not my prayers, I kind of make my own up as I go along, and I forget the reading for the day. Uh, here's a little poem I wrote last night at 2 in the morning when I felt inspired. No need to read from the uh, text here in Isaiah. I'll just read you what I feel. It's unsincere. It's something from my heart. Well, someone would have said, this is great, but this isn't Judaism. This is the religion of Frank Schaeffer. It's, your, it's a religion of your poetry. It's your feelings. They may be sincere. You may be a nice guy. You may be trying to be a Jew. But Judaism is this book. Well, the Christian era was absolutely no different. To be a Christian meant that you did certain things. First, you were baptized. Second, you went to confession, and not into your pillow, but with the church leaders, in the same way we read that Paul did in the book of Acts. After his great conversion experience, he didn't go out and form a ministry, and uh, some start some big multimedia television ministry. What did he do? He went up to Jerusalem. No matter that he had seen Christ in person and had a tremendous vision and been blinded, a disciple had to relieve him of his blindness in repentance, and he went up to Jerusalem to be sent out by the apostles. Um, well, in a similar fashion, we find an orderliness in worship. And to reverse that example I used a few moments ago, if you had people coming into each other's churches from any period of history, a second century Christian from Antioch coming into a 10th century Byzantine church, and they had been there for even five seconds, even if they did not understand the language, they would have known where they were. Why? Because here you would have had a priest facing the altar, here you would have had the Eucharistic chalice, here you would have had the focus of worship on the Eucharist, here you would have had people who were coming to the Eucharist as they had from the beginning, here you would have had the prayers and the psalms of the church as they go back into the first centuries of the church, here would have been all those visible landmarks that I would have if you dropped me on my little mountainside in Switzerland, figuratively speaking. And so worship, this third column, this third area of truth, was something that was that was as taken for granted and as absolute, and I know that's an unfashionable word today, and as non-negotiable as so-called moral teachings that are still held in Protestant communities are today. And I'll give you an example. For instance, the marriage contract. If a liberal Protestant says to a more conservative Protestant, well, I've grown beyond these old-fashioned notions of family, and to me, a family is three lesbians living with a Doberman Pinscher. <laughs> the, the conservative Protestant says, no, wait a minute. God's plan for family goes back to the beginning, to the Garden of Eden, and this is what it is. It's a man and woman living in a faithful relationship, committed for, to a lifetime, uh, committed for a lifetime to each other, bearing children, a fruitful relationship. These are the things that make up marriage. Moreover, it's a sacrament, and a Protestant would say that too, and you can't mess with it. But the strange thing is, when it comes to the actual sacraments of the church, um, they devolve. And in the Protestant community, after the Reformation, and before that, in the Roman Catholic West, there had been a devolution, falling away from the basic sacramental teachings of the church. But 
by the time you get back into the historic church, you find that these things were no more all over the place than in conservative Protestant circles the marriage vows are. They were taken as absolute. Christians worship in this way, not some other way. Christians believed in this way, not some other way. Christians repented and behaved in this way, not some other way. Now, no one was perfect. One of the sacraments of the church was repentance, confession, and penance, which made room for the fact that we all backslide, we all have terrible times in our lives, we all sin, but this was the standard. And so, to conclude this part, and we'll come to questions afterwards, I would simply say this, that for me, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that I became Orthodox is finally that when I began to be involved and exposed to actual Orthodox churches, I found the living witness or the continuity of these certainties that I discovered in church history. Here was a group of people who were continuing in their liturgy and worship to do the things that I had read about and had thought had kind of just faded away into chaos, and yet here they lived in unbroken continuity going back to the beginning. Here was, a, here was a people who taught the same moral structure that you read about in the early church. They did not change. It was not uh, uh, being swept with the winds of the times. And here were people who were in the area of doctrine, could sign on the dotted lines with the apostles, and had changed nothing in that area. In fact, had defended it with the ecumenical councils uh, in the first centuries of the church. And had defended it with the blood of the martyrs right into our own era in the Soviet Union, for instance had not bowed, had not bent uh, to the world as it moved. And so, obviously, there were many personal reasons, but one of the reasons I became Orthodox was simply because of its glorious consistency when it seemed that all else had either crumbled or was fast dissolving around me when it came to the Christian world. And so, as you'll see if you look at, if you read uh, Dancing Alone, and as, as you'll see if you read Letters to Father Aristotle or, or uh, uh, if you get the Christian activist, you will find that this journey, uh, this little brief explanation I've given you here tonight, is somewhat substantiated by a, a far bigger frame of reference, um, and that obviously tonight I don't have the time to lay the whole thing out, but you'll also find um, that it was not a journey of just an emotional response. It wasn't that I walked into an Orthodox church and said, oh, I love the smell of incense, or isn't that a beautiful icon, or I feel so happy here. Although, by the way, those aren't very, those are not bad reasons. Uh, better that than nothing. But it actually, uh, if you read Dancing Alone or Letters to Father Aristotle, you'll find that the difference between the East and West is profound. And the most profound part is that the East believes in holy mystery and has maintained this liturgical practice of worship and awe. Uh, and, and the West, in a way, has squandered it, and we have tended to lose that. So with that, I'll draw a line under uh, this part. We have some refreshment. In about 10 minutes, we'll come back. And this would be a good time before the discussion. I'll go over where the papers are there. If you want to leave these cards off, I'll be glad to take them. And uh, as I said, you know, are you supposed to be on KPOK Friday, uh, but things have, have, to, have to change. Uh, however, uh, this is not the first time that I have heard a friend speak on this subject or other subjects pertaining to family life and uh, our society in this modern time. But um, I've always um, been encouraged and, and, and very happy personally uh, to have you here. So at least for the people who desire to hear the, the prophetic voice, and I say that with a sincerity of heart, he is one, and uh, we are a community have been really blessed to have him speak not only in Rome City, but of course our places in North America and in Canada. Um, before I uh, ask him to come forward and to uh, answer you some of your questions, uh, I don't know whether you have this inquiry class sheet set of us. If we do have every uh, Tuesday night a, a lecture, uh, on church history, uh, the work of the Holy Scriptures, Holy Traditions, Sacraments, uh, Holy Icon, the worship, knowledge, eschatology, etc. Uh, this is open to the public if you have charge, and that doesn't necessarily that you come here to become Orthodox, no, but if you desire to learn more about the faith so that you can share it with others, because you only can walk in the life you have. See, I learn every time I hear speaker, I learn. And so I have been invited also today with the Reformation era and 
past two hundred years, uh, learning from the Western exposure versus Eastern exposure. So I uh, want up and he's open to your questions. This one gentleman came up and had a question. I said, ask me first off, so go ahead. Mr. Treasury, the Roman Catholic Church claims to have the same heritage as the Orthodox Church, right? I'll repeat the question. The question was, the gentleman was, that the Roman Catholic Church has a similar heritage. Could I outline some of the differences between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy? I would divide what I would say into a couple of parts. Uh, first of all, risk of giving a plug to my book again. But an author will always give another plug to his book. Uh, Dancing Alone has a very significant section on this. Uh, if you want to get that, and even more so is my new book, Letters to Father Aristotle, which has uh, a long section on uh, the difference between the modern Roman Catholic Church and Orthodoxy. That's an unpublished book, but you can order it back there afterwards. Having said that, I would divide the differences into two parts, what I would call contemporary, modern, North American Roman Catholicism, and then the historical differences. Working from the present back, um, if you look at the contemporary North American Roman Catholic Church, in other words, forget the theory, uh, who's the Pope, who's Billy Oakway, these historical divisions, and just look at the contemporary situation. American Roman Catholicism today, in our culture, is as rebellious and all over the place as Protestantism is. There are not 23,000 Roman Catholic denominations, but in terms of the way liturgy is served, the doctrines held, the diversity between the theologians, you have everything from the Marxist and the liberationist theologians all the way over to the, to the ultra-liberal theologians of Western Europe and North America. You have rebellious, anti-papal bishops. You have faithful bishops. You have people who still perform the Tridentine Latin Mass out of kind of nostalgic pre-Vatican II uh, feeling. You have modern people's masses with guitar strumming and mini-skirted ex-nuns, pink balloons, uh, that would put any charismatic group to shame as sort of dull and uninteresting. And so you have all points in between. So the first thing to say is there's a vast difference between, forget the history, that if you just look tonight at folks visiting America, let's say, for instance, that you had some Orthodox who were actually foolish enough to want to be unified from Catholicism out of some idea of one world body of Christianity. Well, my question to them would be, what kind of Catholicism are you going to unite with? Are you united with the high papal mass of St. Peter's? Or are you united with, for instance, the liturgy that I went to a few weeks ago uh, at a school nearby where the Eucharist was being served by children, where somebody was sitting on the edge of the guitar, uh, the altar strumming the guitar, uh, where the, the homily consisted of what must be described as sort of a, a new age, uh, weird mixture of 1960s American feel goods psycho babble with no Christian overtones, or, you know, are we going to the Sistine Chapel? So, the first thing I'd have to ask you if we were in a discussion over a long cup of coffee would be, well, what Roman Catholic Church are you talking about? So, if you want to know the difference between Orthodoxy and contemporary American Roman Catholicism, it really is the same difference between Orthodoxy and Protestantism. You have liturgical history, continuity, uh, you have the, the ancient sacraments maintained, you have absolute liturgical unanimity on one side, and on the other you have all kinds of stuff. Now, when you look at the historical differences, they're different, it's something else. Historically, the main division between Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism comes down to only one point. Now, there are lots of other things, but it, it all comes down to this. Who is the Pope and what is his authority? Now, if the Pope is the Bishop of Rome, in good standing with the other bishops of the world. He is an Orthodox bishop with all the authority an Orthodox bishop has. Not only that, he is a patriarch of a very venerable and ancient see. It is not the most ancient of Christian churches. Jerusalem is. It's not the first Christian see. Jerusalem is. Not, not Rome. But it is an ancient see. One of those sees that Irenaeus talks about saying, you want to know what the New Testament is, look at the ancient sees who maintain the scriptures the longest. Rome would be one of them. Alexandria, Rome, Antioch would be another, Jerusalem, and so forth. But if the Pope is what he was declared to be in the 19th century, officially, and had been believed to be since about the 10th to the 12th century onwards, which is this infallible vicar of Christ,
Christ speaking ex cathedra for all Christians, who is able to cut both political and ecclesiastical appeals of temporal power in the name of the whole church, to whom all other bishops have to bend the knee, then he's not an Orthodox bishop. He is the first Protestant, because he has declared himself to be outside of the historical church, which always saw itself as conciliar. So when you look, for instance, at how we got something called the Nicene Creed, okay, to which many Christians subscribe, it comes from the Council of Chalcedon, which was called, to which all the bishops of the world came. Now, that doesn't mean literally every bishop was there. It was everybody who could get there, basically. A ecumenical council or a representative, or one bishop representing several. When you look at the ecumenical councils called by the popes after they began, after they divided themselves off and were divided from the, the rest of the universal church, they're very different. It's simply the bishops of the Western church who will pledge allegiance to papal power. And all the other bishops of the church, in fact, the majority of bishops, if you want to look numerically, because the Eastern church covers a far greater landmass than the middle of Western Europe did at that point, were not invited. Why? Because they did not say, this bishop is in charge of uh, everything. Moreover, this bishop has special ecclesiastical powers to speak for the whole church. They did not recognize that. So for instance, if you look at the patriarch of Constantinople today, that some people in the Western press who don't understand orthodoxy will call the Eastern Pope, because they always got to have a quick label for something. Um, you know, God help us if anything is complex or actually has some nuance to it. Um, but of course, he's not the Eastern Pope. Uh, he is a patriarch of a very venerable and ancient see of the church with all the deference that that gives him. But he doesn't speak for God and the Holy Spirit in some special way that other bishops do not. He doesn't have any kind of magical power to declare a new dogma without an ecumenical council being called to, to, to uh, explore this. Um, he doesn't have any special political authority over all Christians in the world. Uh, it's a very, very different setup. Now, out of these papal differences came the ability of the Western Church to suddenly make new dogma. Why? Because they had Christ on earth. See, Christ had showed up in the person of the Pope, which means that he could sit down and decide, for instance, on the Immaculate Conception. And he could suddenly say, the Church believes in the Immaculate Conception. And the Eastern Church would say, well, since when? We don't believe Mary was created without sin, somehow above the rest of humanity. We believe she was at most favored by God, but still a human being. Only Christ was created instead of us. Where do you get this from? Well, the Pope says it's this way, is basically what it is. Boils down to it. And they would say, well, where's the conciliarity? Where are the checks and balances? Where are all the other bishops of the world who have equal authority with you to, to uh, look at things like this and to rein in excess? Well, you see, they're not there. And so when it gets to, for instance, the Pope uh, and, and the Roman Catholics changing the Nicene Creed and adding the Filioque, which is this line about the, the uh, Holy Spirit proceeding from both the Father and the Son, that's one of the differences that comes out of this idea of Western separate kind of papal authority. But it's rooted back to that. So I would say, just to fast forward, if you were going to say, well, what's the differences between the Roman Catholics today and the Orthodox? Well, let me list some. One, the Orthodox Church does not recognize a pope who is the vicar of Christ. We recognize human beings called bishops who, for reasons of order and doctrinal purity, are in charge of the church, not because they're any better than the rest of us, but because somebody's got to be in charge, just like I'm no more sinless than my children, but somebody's got to tell them when to turn the TV off. Because we work, live in a world where you need order. And if we're going to maintain our tradition, someone has to say, no, you know, in the Schaefer family, we don't watch MTV all night long. Part of our tradition is, is we sleep and we read. Well, in the Orthodox Church, they say, no, you know, we're not going to be dancing a jig on the altars. We're not going to be celebrating Earth Day and feeding the Eucharist to geese, uh, as I saw in St. John the Divine in New York some time ago on Earth Day in the big Episcopal Cathedral there, where they gave the host to geese. Okay? No, that's not in our tradition. See, we say human beings here, the rest of creation there. Um, you know, Christ did not come to save beasts, though he did come to redeem the earth. He came to save sinners and human beings who are free moral agents of choice. This is our tradition. We can't do that. That's why we have bishops, not to make pronouncements for Christ. In fact, it's the other way around. They are bound by the tradition not to innovate. They have to hold to what has always been passed down. Innovation is a dirty word in the Orthodox Church. So what's, that's one difference. 
second difference. Out of that, particular differences like the Filioque came. Well, obviously, we Orthodox don't subscribe to these new additions. I'd say, well, it's, it was in the ninth century. Well, that's new to us because the Orthodox Church has been around 2,000 years, so you're talking about something that broke a thousand year precedent practically. Third thing is, in terms of the modern situation, the irony is that the Orthodox Church actually has some liturgical stability in these other things. And supposedly, it should be more chaotic because it has no one dictatorial head. And yet, the Orthodox Church would teach that the Holy Spirit has led it, and that its bishops have maintained the tradition in spite of their weaknesses, and the conciliar method works. So those would be some of the differences. And then in terms of just on the ground, empirically, it so happened in our period of history that if you go to this Antiochian church and then you fly to New England and go to a Greek church out in California, you're going to find some differences, um, and, but you're not going to find them all over the place. You know, you're going to find the iconostasis in the altar, and you will find the priest facing the altar rather than putting a show on for the people, rather than leading them in worship to God. And you're going to find Eucharistically, liturgically-based services. And you will not find someone sitting on an Orthodox altar playing a guitar. You will find unanimity, and you will find that if you examine what's going on and read a history, such as Ugaira's diary of a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in the third century, at Holy Week, and you look at what happens and say, this church at Holy Week, you can take her diary and her pilgrimage as a guide to what will go on here next Holy Week. And you literally wouldn't be lost, because very little has changed. That's from the third century. And yet if you take that and try to use that as a guide in a Roman Catholic church, you won't be any closer than you would in a Protestant. So in terms of who has maintained the traditions of the church, hey, that's no argument. Maybe they're wrong traditions. Maybe they're false. But nobody would disagree that the Orthodox Church is the most ancient, the most consistent, and the least changed of the Christian bodies. That is a universally acknowledged fact. And so I'd say those would be a number of the differences. But again, I would urge you, if you're interested in this, to read both letters to Father Aristotle and Michael Dancing alone, because between those two books, you're going to get a pretty good answer on those questions. Yes, there's another question. Yes, sir. Are you troubled at all uh, about following the priest father when Jesus went out of his way? This has shut the door for me 20 years ago to both the sure. Roman Church and the Orthodox Church because that's the earliest tradition and it's simple and you can't sure. put a spin on it and it's just like, I don't just want to know how you right. feel personally. Well, obviously, I, I have no problem with it, because if I thought that's what Christ meant by that, um, then, I would, then I would obviously not be orthodox. But actually, there's a very good booklet um, published by Conciliar Press called Call No Man Father, I think, question mark. And it may even be here in your bookstore. I don't know. If it's not here, then they can get it for you. But, you know, very briefly, yeah, very briefly, we can, I can make an explanation here as, as uh, Father Nasser can, but all, all I would just say is that that's an example, and then I think I'm going to ask Father Nasser to answer that. Um, that's an example of the kind of proof texting where one removes something from the context of the New Testament, uh, um, and, and, and by doing that, somewhat changes its meaning. And a good example of that is the fact that in the New Testament era itself, um, you not only have the term, you not only have the terms of respect used for both the rabbis and the apostles, uh, but you have the same authority claim uh, by the apostles, which if you take that kind of a text and apply it and say, well then, therefore, the model is kind of Protestant equality, obviously this isn't how the Old Testament, or rather the New Testament church understood it. I'll give you one example. When Ananias and Sapphira were brought before Peter and the Jerusalem Council, Obviously, the authority invested in the apostles and the, the church leaders was not one of a kind of a, uh, a, a, a Western-style evangelical uh, Bible church democracy. And when you have when you have Paul writing in his most authoritative vein to the churches in the New Testament era, um, he expects to be obeyed. And so, you know, I'd say there's two answer parts to looking at that whole question. One is the specific about the use of the term father. And I'll ask Father, Ar uh, yeah, Father Aristotle. <laughs> uh, I'll ask Father Master to answer that. I also recommend that you read that pamphlet. But the other one is somehow this idea that <clears throat> individual texts out of scripture um, mean something outside of the context of how they've been taken. 
And so when you read the earliest writings of the church fathers themselves, like Ignatius of Antioch, saying that the bishop stands in the place of Christ in terms of the way he's to be treated and respected, um, and when you, when you find that that is how they interpreted these things, my reaction is very similar to those who say, take the book of Exodus and talk about imagery in the church and then say, well, we're to have no great image, so how can you have icons? Well, it's really ironic that anyone would do that because in the very same Old Testament, uh, you, have the most, you have the most sophisticated iconography um, described and not only described, but commanded by God with the seraphim and the cherubim and the, the labor and the, uh, the tabernacle that you can imagine describing, the pomegranates and so forth. So obviously what that meant in that instance of imagery was not that you, you do not have any iconography in worship. If it, if it did, then God was obviously uh, speaking uh, contradictory. Father Master, just say something about Palma Man Father, because I think would be good. This is Father Master. First of all, uh, we have to go to the Old Testament, to the, uh, the time of Christ, the usage of Aramaic language. Uh, there are three words, and that's when you translate Aramaic or Hebrew into the English language, sometimes vocabularies, you don't, you don't have the proper vocabulary translation. So, in the Aramaic language, in the Hebrew language, you have three words for father. You have your habit, first of all, you have your, you, you have a father, don't you? I surely do have a father. So every one of us have a father. In Arabic, father means Abi. In Aramaic. Now, for we have also in Aramaic a spiritual father who is Abina. Is Abina is our father. My father, spiritual father, the adopted father. Then the heavenly father is used Abana. There is three words, Abana, Abina, Abi. Three words in Arabic or in Aramaic. There is no translation to that into English, so that's the problem. But to go further than that, St. Paul said, you may have many fathers, but I have begotten thee. Now, that is spiritual adoption. And in that respect, in that understanding, uh, we use this term father with the small f, shall I say. Uh, we don't, when we relate it father in the human term, we don't say in the heavenly aspect. So I say to, I don't, and it, it's very dare to say, you know, but say to my father, dad. I mean, it's not in the language, our language is semi dad. You know, father, he is my father. He's not my dad, he's my father. It's more impressive, more dynamic, more enriching, but that word is lost its meaning. And people are afraid even to, to call their, their dad, as they say, father, this is my father. See, fearing psychologically or because they are in scriptures, nobody would call father, uh, anyone father except heaven, uh, father who is in heaven. So there is a problem here in translation and semantic language. Okay? And I hope that now we have some pamphlets or some information to go deeper than that. And then we come to these lectures, we can express them even more details, but it is all biblical. And beyond that, when we say father, my father, which I have it, that my father, then I have a spiritual father, that is the priest who have been ordained to be your spiritual father, as just Paul was brought the people. He said, You may have many fathers, I have begotten in me spiritually, then you have that many fathers. So one in our understanding in the spirit, when we use the word father, it implies three things. We remind us of our earthly father that I have a father. Well, it doesn't mean that you have a father. Did there be people have fathers and go with their fathers? So there is a physical father between me and my dad, me and my father. Second is, when you say father, out of respect to the priesthood of the church. And then above that, is to remind you of your heavenly father. So it has also tripod, three dimensions. Okay. And I, I think there's all, then you know, what the question is big there is, well, then what did Christ mean? Well, obviously he did not mean that we never use terms of 
respect for people because he did himself for the high priest and for the rabbinical order. And we also find in the New Testament that um, not only was respect given to the apostles, but that the terminology used for respect for other people outside of the church context, uh, whether it was the rabbi, the chief priest, uh, the Roman centurion, uh, King Herod, uh, your own parents, we don't find a kind of a communistic egalitarianism coming in in the New Testament era. Um, people are still given their titles. People are still given their due. So obviously, from the point of view of church teaching, what Paul, no man and father, has always meant from the beginning um, is exactly the same kind of thing that we see in the passages against idolatry uh, or against worshiping other human beings. And that is that we are to look to God for our spiritual guidance. Uh, we are not to look to an individual human being to stand in the place of God. And that really actually ties very much in with that other question, because you see, that would be the orthodox objection to the idea of calling the Pope the vicar of Christ. That, from our point of view, that would be um, uh, doing something mistaken, and that is uh, elevating a human being to the place of what Kavanasa was talking about, which was this, this term reserved only for the fatherhood of God. Um, and confusing the two. But, but obviously, in reading the New Testament in its, in con in its, its context, and seeing how uh, the historic church dealt with these issues, the idea of a kind of egalitarian equality was not what existed in the church. And the idea of stripping everybody of their titles and not calling your mother mother, uh, not calling your father father, not calling priest father, not giving the apostles the respect they were given, uh, not giving the rabbis in the Jewish tradition the respect they were given. We, didn't, we just don't find that. Um, so it wasn't like some communistic commune that just stripped away all titles. In fact, we, we see the opposite. We see uh, tremendous respect for the office. Uh, we see Paul talking about uh, risking our salvation and even our life if we come in properly to the table of the Lord, which, which means not only the person coming, but, but the properness of how it's being served, how it's guarded. We see all kinds of uh, authority structures. Um, and so, you know, to me, I'm just speaking for myself now, um, that never seemed like a question because the, the, the church had never received that teaching in that way, just as the church always has had images uh, from the very beginning in it, and obviously had not received the teaching in Exodus against worshiping graven images as being something against iconography. So from my point of view in my own journey towards the historical church, uh, the kind of idea that one could take a proof text out of the New Testament and hold it up against the whole practice of the church seemed sort of inverted, because obviously this very text had been defended for three centuries and kept in the canon by people who called other people father and called their and gave their bishops titles of respect. Um, and, and it just didn't seem to make sense to me that, the, that, that, I would, that I would feel that somehow there was a conflict between the tradition of the the respect and the hierarchy of the church and the text which that church itself, a great cost to itself, had defended. Uh, I had never had a problem with that. I mean, you have another question. Yes, sir. What was the risk of having your parents talk to in the first part? I'm wondering. Uh, what I saw you were awake. So I know. <laughs> uh, what would uh, some of the, I guess, conservative Protestants say to the Orthodox Church? Uh, people like Sproul and Packer and uh, sure. Kennedy and MacArthur and so on. What would they say about it and uh, where would they depart from it and what did they miss? Well, the gentleman asked a question. It's a very good one. What would the conservative Protestants say, like Sproul, Packer, Kennedy, and some others? That would not be Kennedy from Massachusetts, where I live, but Pastor Kennedy in Florida. I'm sure you mean not Ted Kennedy. I've heard Ted describe a lot of things, but never a conservative Protestant. <laughs> The first thing I would say, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck, but from an orthodox point of view, there's no such thing as a conservative Protestant. And that's really mind-blowing. When you read Dancing Alone, my book, if you do, you will see that I make a pretty good case for the fact that, that in the true sense of the word of how we mean it, you know, Protestantism is by de facto liberalism. Why? Because it is sawn through one and maybe one and a half and often three legs, but in the case of the conservative Protestants, one leg of this stool. It has actually obliterated a third of the church's tradition. I don't mean consciously. 
but by default. So you cannot call someone a conservative if they have obliterated the past of their movement knowingly or unknowingly. If you have a group of Protestants calling themselves conservative, it's only in reference to how much even more liberal some other Protestants are. In reference to the Orthodox Church, they're as liberal as the most agnostic uh, professor of uh, theology in the Harvard Divinity School. Um, because I don't mean in terms of their salvation or the relationship with Christ or judging them, I'm just speaking theologically. Why? Because if you saw through the lay of historical worship, if you saw through the lay of apostolic accountability, um, you're left with certain doctrines and certain moral teachings, but they no longer have their foundation in what the historic church always would have considered essential. The second thing I would say is that my guess is, and again, I, I hope this doesn't sound uh, arrogant, but that if Francis Schaeffer didn't know who the Orthodox Church was and never explained it to his son, in a family in which he welcomed new information, if that's how unknown Orthodoxy is in, what, in, in North American milieu, we were living in Switzerland, my dad was a North American Protestant in terms of background, then my guess is, is that most of my good Protestant friends would, would embarrass themselves very quickly in a dialogue with an Orthodox who knew something about Protestantism and Orthodoxy, not because they're stupid and not because they're ignorant. But for the following reason, you have to understand what Orthodox, what Protestants generally know about Orthodoxy in terms of theology and history is this. First of all, they know the Protestant version because they've never studied Orthodoxy. It's always a footnote in some textbook. Secondly, the Protestant version of church history is Roman Catholic church history. What's so funny is the Protestants say they rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church. They did. They, they have absolutely continued one aspect of the Roman Catholic Church, and that is to totally ignore the East. So if you read Protestant theologians like Arnach of the 19th century, for instance, or even people like Gibbon, just a general historian uh, from that period, Protestant historians, um, out of the Reformation culture, their take on orthodoxy is usually as unfavorable and jaded as the Roman Catholic take. Now, why is the Roman Catholic take as unfavorable? Well, it goes back to this gentleman's question. You see, from the Roman Catholic point of view, orthodoxy cannot exist. It should have failed existing. In exactly the same way as if Marx was right, capitalism in the West should have destroyed itself. We should not still be here. We are an embarrassment to every true Marxist because we're here. Forget what we do or what we say. The very existence of a working capitalist economy is a contradiction because their theory rests on the fact that it must self-destruct. You have to understand that the historical argument <coughs> for the authoritarian papacy is that without this institution, liturgical, theological, dogmatic, and moral chaos will reign in the, in the church in the world. So from a Catholic point of view, they welcome the Protestant 23,000 denominations because it seems like a very good historical justification. <coughs> Excuse me. From a Catholic point of view, however, orthodoxy is a disaster. Because here we have a 2,000-year continuity of liturgical purity and teaching. Here we have a 2,000-year continuity of apostolic succession that, they, that the Roman Catholics know perfectly well. We're in an Antiochian church, okay? This is a church, okay, so Metropolitan Philip, Said the Philip, who, who is the, is the uh, patriarch, if you like, of North American Antiochian Orthodoxy. That's not his official title, but in effect, okay? The bishop who ordained him, and the bishop who ordained him, and so on, 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 can literally trace themselves back to the Sea of Antioch, which is a New Testament church. I mean, these people, this was a sophisticated society when Rome was a declining cow town, literally. And here it still is. Now, how can it still be in business? So you have to understand that orthodoxy on the Roman map, until very recently in terms of modern ecumenism, is not supposed to exist. So you take a Francis Schaeffer, bring it to my own family, or you take a Dr. Kennedy, all right, they go off to a Protestant seminary. The Protestant seminary is already ignoring church history because there's no percentage in Protestants teaching young Protestants about church history. Why? Because it makes nonsense of the whole Reformation. If we have something to learn from before Luther, then what are we doing cutting ourselves off liturgically, historically, and everything else from these people? The whole thing comes away in their hands. But it's a double filter. It's a double whammy because not only does the Protestant not learn about Western church history, what they learn dimly like an echo of Eastern church history that filters through 
the pitiful small amount of even Western church history is the Western Roman Catholic view of the East, which is, let's not talk about it. It's the withered branch. It doesn't exist. It can't be on the map. Because if it's still on the map, then why does Peter need the reins of the church in his hand when you have all these other bishops being faithful to God's leadership? And so you have to see that it's thrice removed. All right? Now, when on top of that, you fast forward into modern America, where high school diplomas aren't worth what secondary diplomas used to be worth, where colleges are remedial training for high schools, where you have to get a PhD before you get the education that an 18-year-old from a good British private school would have had in the 19th century. All right? Where you have to spend a lifetime in personal self-initiated study to even become literate in this culture, because we are in a, in a functionally illiterate, highly technological, but functionally illiterate culture. Where America itself is removed now even from its own history, let alone its historical roots in Europe, let alone those roots in the historical church. You've gotten to an era in which literally it is almost impossible to learn anything about Christendom unless you literally go on a personal quest. No one will tell you. No one is interested. No one benefits by learning by comparison. So what amazes me is the level of ignorance. I have a very good friend of mine who's a well-known Protestant intellectual and uh, uh, by the name of Oz Guinness. He's an old friend of mine. Okay? I got a letter from Oz one time when I was thinking of converting to Orthodoxy. He says, listen, before you jump into Orthodoxy, you should really read a book titled, that was titled Why Catholics Can't Sing. And it was a book about what's wrong with modern Roman Catholicism. Well, at the time I thought it was odd. You know, why is Oz telling me to read a book on Roman Catholicism? I don't want to become Orthodox. This is apples, these are oranges. He honestly thought that this is the best he could do. In other words, here we have someone who went to Oxford University, got himself a deep bill, goes around lecturing to evangelicals, and yet the best he could come up with for his old buddy Frankie Schaefer to try to dissuade him from entering the Orthodox Church was to read a book that had something to do with modern American Roman Catholicism and in no way applies to modern Orthodox. So without any disparagement, because 15 years before, if our positions had been reversed, I would have done exactly the same thing. I don't know. It would have been, well, they're sort of like, you know, isn't that part of the Catholic something? We don't know much about them. We sure don't know anything about these guys. And so what would, what would they think? Nothing. Uh, because they have absolutely no information on the subject, and what they have is totally inaccurate. And that's not a condemnation, that's just a statement of the State of the Union. Yes, Dr. Uh, no Protestants out there with scholastic integrity? Pardon? No Protestants out there with scholastic integrity? I think Francis Schaeffer had a lot of scholastic integrity, but you all walk by the light you're given. Look, you know, you ask me... Well, I mean, you've, you've been cheering, obviously, and as, as a... I mean, surely they've heard of you and heard what you're, you know, saying, and wouldn't, are they afraid to investigate? Well, listen, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, um, uh, and maybe I'm sticking my neck out here, better not take this part, but, um, no, I'll be honest with you, one of the things that has absolutely amazed me in the last six, seven years in this passage of orthodoxy is that the only Protestants I have met personally or publicly, in a forum like this, or personally. This is really surprising me. You know, this is sticking my neck out here. The only Protestants I've met who had, we had a discussion with on this issue <clears throat> have been one of several types. First of all, I keep waiting for the other shoe to fall. I keep waiting for people to say, how can you do this? I, look, I remember, I'm not all that old, but I remember an era within the Protestant community where everybody was so sure of their own doctrinal background that if you deviated, you were read out of the deal. That's it. Okay. Protestantism is in such chaos in this country, and I mean evangelical Protestantism. There's such a lack of certainty, and that I would, I'll, break, I'll break down the reaction like this. About 60% of the people I've talked to are just either don't care, because they really cease to believe in the idea of truth. It's so subjective now. It's like, well, I have Jesus in my heart, that's all I need. Or, if they care, they're wistfully curious. Not at all tell, you know, how can you do this? What about Luther? You know, it's like, tell me more, obviously we're losing our way. 
Okay, that's one group. Another group, uh, a very small group, is irrationally um, anti-orthodox. And then when you ask them, now what is it about orthodoxy you don't like? You literally get answers like, well, how can you have a pope? Uh, well, that's why we're not Roman Catholics. You know, how can you say Mary was created without sin? Well, that's one of our big divisions with the West. We believe she wasn't. You know, we don't believe in the Immaculate Conception. Well, why do you worship idols? We don't worship idols. You know, the veneration of iconography goes back to the, the catacombs of Priscilla from the year 120 in Rome, or 130 or 80 or whatever it was. We, we read in Eusebius' best oration that they kept the, the throne of St. James uh, for purposes of veneration in the Church of Jerusalem. The Church has always had a sense of its history and its martyrs and its saints. And we've always had pictorial representations of gospel history. What do you talk? So, so what I found is, is a lot of the people who very sincerely or aggressively, literally, and again, I don't mean this disparagingly, but they know so little of what orthodoxy is, and they think somehow it's Roman Catholicism, say, or what they heard, they don't really know very much about Catholicism often either. But, and then there's a group of uh, people who you would really expect some real debate from. Okay, Oz Guinness, a um, number of my friends who teach theology at Gordon Conwell, for instance, just down the road, who I have dinner with once in a while. What are they doing? They're busy writing books about the decline and destruction of evangelical Protestantism. Literally. David Wells, for instance. What, what are the intellectuals in Protestant circles today doing? They are trying to find the new C.S. Lewis and lead them into the next level of spirituality. They have completely given up on contemporary Protestantism. And they're so busy denouncing in far more harsh terms than I would dare denounce in my books as an ex-Protestant, the current condition of Protestantism, A to Z, soup to nuts, theologically, doctrinally, liturgically, everything, that they have no time to pay any attention one poor renegade like me who escaped. And so you don't find, uh, you, you do not find, I just have not run into the buzzsaw I expected. And when it's been a buzzsaw, it's either been the kind where someone just yells the Bible verse out, you hear Exodus, this, 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 how can you say that? So it's the kind of off the map thing, or it's just tell me more, or it's, you know, Orthodoxy is still unimportant. Let's get back to cleaning up evangelicalism, which is the only game in town. And then you find, you know, rabbit, disappointment, bitterness. I mean, good friend of mine, Carl Cricket, who became a Roman Catholic a few years ago, told me, he said, you know, something really ironic. This is a guy who goes through Chuck Colson's books for him, and, you know, he was right on the inside of the machine. Okay? This is a good friend of mine. His dad was a pastor of the biggest church in Los Angeles, or even super churches. He grew up in the whole deal. Harold and I have compared notes over the year, and he said, you know, what nobody realizes out there in the heartland is that the people who are running the Christian megalopolises now in places like Colorado Springs, Wheaton, Illinois, Chicago, the professors who are teaching at Wheaton, the key people for Dr. Dobson, all of Chuck Colson's staff, Chuck Colson himself, this is what they don't realize about any of these guys, is none of them are evangelicals anymore. The key players are either all moving towards Catholicism, or they're all going to high Episcopal Anglican churches. A few of them are still Reformed Protestants. And other than that, the key players have left the scene. He says, you know, all my friends on the editorial board of Christianity today, he says, not one of the people that I used to know who were Protestants would still describe themselves as such. Now, I'm not saying they become Orthodox. I said, where are they going? They're sneaking off the Roman Catholic churches, or Orthodox churches, or they're going to high Anglican churches with sort of a mixture of liturgy and Anglicanism, but one thing they are not is satisfied any longer with their local Bible this or their local that. They see that this whole thing is just clear. So, you know, when you say, well, what's been the Protestant reaction? It's like, well, you know, it's almost a sort of government job. And uh, it has not been what I expected. Um, Protestantism is not together anymore. And um, I'd say the problem is a very different one. Instead of hard reactions, my problem is been often getting any reaction in the sense that Protestants see things so much in pluralistic terms of just, well, we're all in just other denominations. That's great. I mean, you know, you're concerned about history and truth, and I'm into the 12-step codependency thing, you know, with a little Christianity mixed in, and my mother here is like really into such and such an author, and you know, isn't this great? And I get Dr. Dobson's newsletter, and 
it just becomes this huge, uh, mushy kind of amalgam of experiential stuff that, you know, the few lone voices that are out there talking about history or truth or, um, uh, you know, precedent or tradition, hey, you know, good, I'm glad you're doing that, you know, I'm into jet ski racing. And, and so it's kind of this all over the map. And that's really, to me, the, the tragedy. The tragedy is, is, you know, as the lights sort of go out and chaos reigns, that instead of people going back and trying to re-step, retrace their step along the path, historically, not their personal steps, and say, well, where did the thing go wrong? Instead of that, they just, you know, just like Planned Parenthood pushes forward from sex education to abortion when sex education fails, the Protestant community doesn't repent. They say the whole, event, the whole experiment of Protestantism has gone off the rails. Let's rethink what we've done. Instead, it's just, uh, let's do some huge thing. You know, let's have promise keepers now. Let, and after that fad wears out, then let's have a new thing. And then we'll all be charismatics. And when that runs its course, we'll all do this. And then we'll, you know, we'll follow Dr. Dobson for 100 yards down the path. And then when he loses his glitter, someone new will arise. And so it's just one, one thing leads to another. Yes? Worship and sacrament and apply it to standing uh, for what one believes. 
studiously avoids applying this to the rest of the culture around it because to do so would mean to sacrifice. So North America is a problem in terms of, of, of this thing. And all I can say is this, that if the positions have been reversed, and if modern North American Protestantism now had to face the test that the Russians faced from about 1917 on, do you think that there would be the blood of hundreds of thousands of martyrs on the ground? Of course not. We would all join the system and figure out how to make a buck off of it and enjoy it. And you know, that would go for a lot of our desacralized Orthodox as well. I'm not saying it's all in the Protestant camp, it's the American culture. This, it's, it's not for nothing that we all save up and take our families to Disneyland. You know, they, just remember this. The, the American reading of choice is what? Have a nice day. You learn the whole thing right there. It's not have a holy day, have a peaceful day. The ancient prayer of the church is have a sinless day. You know, our culture is have a nice day. Well, we're told in the New Testament about having a nice day. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. And we're all very much firming on it, including many people who call themselves Orthodox. Because this culture taints everything it touches. And this is, you know, this is a very entertainment-oriented, very trivial culture. And those of us who are in it have a very hard time seeing that. The problem is Protestantism is quite a big part of developing that because it's, it's a, it fits in perfectly with that mentality. And so I would just say, when we come back to your question, where is everybody? They're all having a nice day. And as long as being in the pro-life movement helped that, because it gave them a sense of meaning, purpose, and oh, Lord, we just this, we just that, fine. But the minute you're going to have to pay a price, pay for it. You know, and that's what I said at the beginning of my talk. We're a culture where Disneyland coexists with Auschwitz. We don't actually shut Auschwitz down. We just build a huge big amusement park next to us and we say, see how nice we are? Look, don't call us a heartless people. Little Jessica fell out of the well and we all cry. Um, look how sincere we are. We deal with our criminals like that. The Menendez brothers walk free because a bunch of people watched too much Oprah Winfrey were struck by their sincerity. And no one said, but did they murder somebody? No, they're such nice boys. Some are all trying to have a nice time. How would they have a nice time in prison? <laughs> that's true. That's American culture. And uh, that's a nice note to finish on. Thank you.
So just 